in the uh, the Reverse Web3 Comic Con event this weekend. I am Evan Matthews, um, here with Adam Martin, my co-conspirator and co-founder at Macroverse, and joined by Bennett Phillips, um, who is, uh, well, we're working with Bennett in some cool things that you'll, uh, you'll find out about more about over this weekend, but also uh, head of partnerships and entertainment at Unstoppable Domains and become someone that we uh, treat as a sounding board and a lot of the fun things that we're putting together and just a you know phenomenal advocate for this intersection of Web3 and entertainment and what that all means for the future. So we're very happy to have Bennett here kind of hosting this conversation today. Um, also joined by Winnie Kemp from J Jump Cut Media and uh, we'll, we'll probably ask Winnie to give a little bit of her secret origin story. Um, but just as a quick preamble, so, you know, this session is really about this concept of the Web3 writer's room or com community storytelling. And all of us have some kind of background in traditional entertainment. So we're going to talk a little bit about what does that even mean <laughs> in the context of, you know, how things normally work and how we're kind of hoping things work in the future and what these things unlock. Um, but these events all weekend are really about like turning the spotlight on the entertainment side of Web3 and entertainment. And so with that context, over to Bennett. All right. Proud to be here with you guys. Um, I think there's so much to explore here. So it, it, the, the mind can go in all sorts of directions in terms of how to spend this next hour or so. But given that you are all not just kind of uh, playing with entertainment in the Web3 space, you're entertainment professionals. We have a background in this. And so know the history of what you're coming from, where the innovation potentially exists, because you know what the traditional way or the conventional way of doing some of these things are. So my first thought was, why don't we start with uh, the way it is now, right? Like before the innovation that Web3 brings to the table, uh, what was it like to sort of get through a storytelling process in a writer's room and maybe talk a little bit about how that changed during COVID where I imagine a writer's room looked a lot like this. <laughs> And then we can we can build on that and go from there into how blockchain technology and and the other things involved in Web three um, can uh, you know can take us to new places. And I, actually, let me pause there and, and maybe just do a quick introduction. If anybody has been tuning into the stream, they may know who Evan and Adam are. Maybe you guys want to say a few words anyway, and then love to hear from you, Winnie, uh, a little bit of your background, and then we can get into that first question. Well, clearly Winnie should talk first and then Adam can tell a little bit about, about us. <laughs> that's very, Sounds that's great. very chivalrous. Very excited to be here. Um, so I have a background as a producer for a long time in Hollywood. I've worked at CBS films. I've worked at CAA. I've worked at, um, and I've worked in indie film. I've worked across digital podcast, TV film. And um, I've always been kind of, shocked that like in the film business they like give one person a script and then they fire them and then they put another person on the script and then they fire them and then they put another person on the script spend like millions and millions and millions of dollars and i was just like i don't know this doesn't seem like the best way but then um sort of when i got into tv it made so much more sense to me that there were rooms right like you have to create so much content and you get a group of people together you know anywhere between one and like sometimes 20 people right um in a writer's room and they're all bringing their own experience and their own storytelling skills to try to attack the showrunner's vision and put something together that is greater than the sum of its parts right and to me um you know, Web3 creates this opportunity that you can, you know, do a lot more and supercharge that. Um, so, you know, I've worked through traditional, um, through digital. My last job was at Super Deluxe, which was a, a company that, uh, that Turner Media had funded, where we were making content for millennials, both online, digitally, and then I ran the TV group. And while I was there, I was able to, you know, work with a whole bunch of underrepresented, really unique voices and was lucky enough to make a show with Sundance Channel for two seasons that was called This Close. Um, it was the first show to be created by Jeff Riders, and they also starred in it. And then I also sold and developed a show with Netflix um, called Chambers and we didn't know it at the time, but it was the first show to star Native American lead in the U.S. And since then, there's been many. But mm -hmm. you know, it was just sort of mind-boggling to me that like 500 shows a year coming out, 
that some of these voices still had no platform to be heard, you know, mm -hmm. um, to be seen. And um, that's another thing that I'm really excited about in terms of Web3 being able to, um, you know, create more equity, you know, and more access into the system too. And that's really the mission of Jump Cut, which is the company that I'm working at now. Um, I started as the head of development there where we were doing Web2 projects, so TV, film, et cetera. And then as the space started heating up last year, like the NFT sort of frothy market, and um, we started thinking about how we could involve communities in storytelling and get more feedback and engage them ahead of time because so much of traditional Hollywood is like, I can't tell you what the log line is. You can't see the script. We don't want you to know. It's a secret. And it's so crazy to me because how do you launch an original thing that could compete with things that already have audiences like IP, you know, best-selling books that are turning into movies or all of that if you can't start building that engagement early on, right? And some of these development processes, as you know, take years and years and years <laughs> for things to get made. Um, and so I was really excited to just be more in the Web3 space and excited to be here. Awesome. Do you guys have anything yeah. you want to add to that? Yeah, go ahead, Adam. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I just, as far as background for both Evan and I, you know, I've spent 25 years now in, in physical production as an assistant director on all sorts of different things. And so, and then increasingly involved in the last 10 years on the TV side and seeing exactly what what Winnie's talking about in terms of how things get developed and watching friends, you know, projects will bubble up and evaporate and, and just kind of watching people navigate that traditional world. Um, and also then seeing what it takes to get something made. And I think there's a, I think on the flip side, there's been this slightly flippant attitude in the Web3 NFT space, which is, well, we've got this cool project. And of course, we'll make a comic and a TV show and a movie and a game. I'm like, hang on a second. You've just described like five years of work <laughs> in a sentence. And you right. were really quick moving through that. So hang on a second. <laughs> um, and I think it is so exciting that the, there is this now increasing kind of meeting of the minds between people coming up in the traditional media who know how to make stuff and these fantastic kind of innovative approaches to storytelling from the Web3 space. I think the intersection of those two is hopefully what we're looking at here and is very, very intriguing um, yeah. from all sorts of perspectives. Yeah, 100%. Well, um, go ahead, Evan. Go ahead. I, was, I was just going to say, I think, you know, the, the, the thing that Adam didn't say is, you know, we've also been writing, directing, and producing content together for the last 20 years across, you know, a wide range of different mediums from, you know, short form to new media to uh, video games to animation to comics and you know kind of all that stuff and so you know I think that the the three of us the four of us really you know kind of in thinking about how these things can work I think the 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 reason I love having these kinds of conversations is that everyone is kind of finding their own approach into it or their own kind of way into it and yet we're all trying to kind of arrive at the same goal so i think there's a it's a real opportunity for kind of skill share learning you know kind of through this process as we ultimately all kind of generally want to arrive in the same place so hmm. i i love this stuff so but in fact i just i think it's interesting there's two common themes i see in in the web3 space and the nft space in particular that is so so like contrary to the way entertainment properties are built one of them is impatience and, <laughs> and and the other one is is transparency you know and not there can't be some not that there can't be some transparency in traditional media production entertainment etc but for the most part things are built behind the scenes and then someone might drop like a teaser trailer or something like that and people go wow there's this new thing that just showed up out of nowhere and it's like no we've been working on that for seven years actually you know or whatever it is so yeah I'd be interested to hear from from any of you on, you know, how that translates when you're you're operating in a market that's wildly speculative and people say that something succeeded or failed three months after it was first announced, you know, or or sometimes shorter or a little bit longer. Maybe you get a year, you know, and if you didn't make it in a year, I guess you're, you know, you didn't get there. Um, <laughs> and when you really pause and think, it's like that's not how it works. So what does that lead to in terms of, you know, for you, both the impatience and the, like, while you're building this thing, people are there with you while you're building it. And so they may see some ideas, maybe somebody, is there any fear of ideas being stolen? You know, well, maybe that is why it's kind of kept under, under one's hat in the traditional uh, entertainment world so that ideas don't get leaked and whatever. So yeah, it's a different game. How do you, how do you see those two, themes playing out in, in what you're building. 
Well, I I'm most excited with like the open transparency, right? Because there's an infinite number of ideas for any one idea. There's an infinite number of paths that you can take, you know, to make something. And, you know, I, I do believe that good ideas come from everywhere and that everyone has a creative spirit within them, whether they pursue a creative path or not, they have something to offer both in their story and the things that they care about and their experiences. And to me, allowing, opening up the process a little bit can be beneficial both for the person who's participating in the process and the person who's creating the process, because, you know, getting feedback along the way is such an important part of any writer's journey, right? Like, mm -hmm. and right now it's very, very narrow because it's like that one executive or that one producer who sort of pushes it up the hill. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the industry, it's such a like crapshoot in a lot of ways. You could put years and years into years in something and then a hundred million dollars and then you put it out and people, you're like, okay, well, I don't know. Are people going to like it? You know, like you just have no idea until that moment. Yeah. Um, you or, or it becomes a tax break for Warner it. Brothers to shell right. <laughs> <laughs> And so like to me, the exciting part is opening up that process earlier where you can, you know, sort of pressure test. And that was sort of what Jump Cut originally was doing was taking mm -hmm. ideas and then putting them out into the world and showing it to audiences and saying, which ones do you like? And then understanding that audience better so that you can make the best possible movie, TV show, whatever it is you're making for the audience that's going to gravitate towards it right not not everything is for everyone and so understanding your audience better is ultimately going to help you make a better a better you know movie whatever you're working on and it's like you can iterate um, yeah, exactly exactly mm -hmm. and i and i sort of liken a little bit to the way Issa Rae made insecure um first as a youtube series called awkward black girl and you know she had enough money to make one or two episodes put it out you know, people like, oh, I love it when she does this, or it's so funny, or I don't like this character, or I don't like that. And then she sort of internalized that, put it out, you know, put out the next few. And it was an iterative process with her audience that then she really knew what she was doing by the time she actually mm -hmm. got to make her show HBO, right? Mm -hmm. And right. that show went on for like five or six seasons um, because she understood her audience and mm -hmm. she knew what her show was, right? And yeah. no one, not everyone's lucky enough to get it right the first time, <laughs> you know, some people do. But um, that's why I'm excited about like connecting audiences closer to the creators, because I think that engagement loop also helps. It helps. It, it, it's beneficial for both sides. Right. We're you at know, this. Or, go ahead, Adam. I, I was going to say, have you found, because um, I think you've got this potential kind of com conflicting two visions, right? There is the what does the community want, the Issa Rae, more of the Issa Rae approach, which is great. On the flip side of that, of course, you've got your Paul Thomas Anderson's or someone like that, who has incredibly singular vision. This is my absolute focus. This is what I want to bring to screen. Do you have, or how have you found the creators you've worked with? Are they, are they excited about the community involvement part or does that intimidate them? Like what, how have you found that dynamic? It's just really funny because the range can really <laughs> vary. Yeah. So um, Jump Cut's working with another NFT collection called um, Society of the Hourglass. They wanted to do an animated show and it's very cute. It's like a kid's animation thing. And so we're partnered with them on the TV show, right? And one of the things that we did was we worked with the community to come up with a curriculum to engage them to build out the world a little bit so that we had a starting point for a writer, right? right? And it wasn't just, oh, here's these things we wanted to engage the community, understand what they were excited about, the things that they wanted to see explored, all of that. So you basically wrote up sort of like a Bible mm -hmm. and, you know, with the community and they were having input, we were making choices, all of that kind of stuff, having calls and discussions and all of that. It was like blown away because it's the first time where I'm like, I don't know how this is going to work. This is going to be nuts, right? <laughs> like, but I was really blown away by the creativity and how in depth some of these discussions were around time travel and around character and around themes and the things that they cared about. And what was most interesting about that was when we took that Bible and we brought it to traditional writers. So people who are in the kids animation space, yeah. right? A lot of people were super, super excited about working with the community. Other, some other people, not for them, sure. you know, like they just want to do what they want to do the way they do it. And they're already successful doing it. They're not interested in finding out more necessarily. And that's totally within their prerogative. Right. But I was actually pretty excited that we had a wide range of writers who were like, wow, this is really cool. And it's figuring out a way that, you know, 
to um, engage with parents and kids earlier on because a lot of the people in the community of society of Alagos are parents, right, right. of young kids. And they want something they can watch with their kids together that, you know, teaches them history and, you know, good moral choices and all of that kind of stuff that you want, for, but not something that just is, like, painful to watch, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, that co-viewing of, like, parents and kids, like, how do you crack that, right? Well, you test it out and you test out those ideas first with an audience of parents who have kids. And, um, and so it's really, really fun to sort of see the excitement around it mm -hmm. and the openness of which they wanted to engage the community. So the ideas were like, oh, well, what if we could, you know, what if we could have a contest to name one of the characters, like the main character, right? And parents could submit their kids' names. And imagine if like the person who won's kid, like has this show, that person's going to tell every single kid in their class, <laughs> you've got to watch this show because it's my character, you know? Yeah. And, um, and times that by, you know, 500, if there's like different characters that people own as NFTs and they're all going out there and saying, you got to see this show, it's very powerful. Um, and so I, I think that's sort of my experience in, in that realm so far. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I mean, the two things you said that I feel like I just want to kind of double click on, like, you know, first is I think we are at this intersection of entertainment and technology. And so... Yeah, I think if we embrace that as storytellers, if we lean into the fact that there are new opportunities here, as opposed to fighting for something that's different, um, then you know that creates new pathways and new opportunities to to do something new and to potentially, you know, I think a lot of a lot of conversation about you know can we actually accomplish more quicker based on the fact that we have these new tools avail available and community being, you know, I hate to say tools and that you know at one of those tools but you know part of the mix of what you know provides that accelerant if we embrace it um and i think you know, in the in the technology conversation you know it's pretty established conventional wisdom when you're doing a startup that's like you want to do things that don't scale you want to you know put out a minimum viable product and get feedback early and often and like this is just like kind of the way that you know you're kind of supposed to do a, a especially a technology startup and yet in the entertainment world you know there is i think you know there has been some resistance to that resistance to that concept until you get more and more to the creator economy i think this is where it gets really interesting as sort of a, a signpost for kind of where this is all headed where the the further away you get from the bigger institutions of the traditional system the more there is that kind of interaction with an audience through patreon or through kickstarter or through um you know social media channels that you know there is a direct relationship between creator and audience and so to me like the big unlock in all of this now is like we can have that direct relationship and you can make it meaningful for both parties. You know, we get this incentive alignment where, you know, we really do have the opportunity to win together. And very much like what you said, I mean, we have absolutely found that, you know, some of the best ideas and anything that we've been involved with in this space have come from the community and have come from places and people that, you know, have maybe got zero experience, you know, mm -hmm. outside of that, you know, uh, that that specific situation in writing or creating characters or stories and yet it's you know going like oh duh like i never would have thought of that it makes perfect sense like that's that's canon we love it <laughs> you know um so it is i think you know for those that are willing to embrace it it's you know it's it's been something that i personally have found to just be absolutely magical um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the the next generation of creators, it just feels like it's going to be a more and more natural fit for just kind of how stuff is made in a lot of cases. So when, when you think back on like every other major wave of new technology that's happened in, in our history, um, often leads to new opportunities for people to, to um, you know, pursue things that maybe they couldn't have before that. So I'm thinking things like Justin Bieber was discovered on YouTube for example, mm -hmm. right? He was just a kid posting his singing on YouTube. And, you know, so do you think that this represents an opportunity for people who may have otherwise never have been known, never have been able to get their writing out there because they couldn't do it as a one person show or whatever. And, uh, you know, I kind of expected an immediate yes <laughs> from this yeah. question, but, but I'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts more on it. Like, so like, if you'd share your thoughts on how, how is that showing up? Are you already seeing it show up? How yeah. does that translate to people in 
maybe it's because of where they live. Maybe it's because of, you know, the means they come from. Maybe it's whatever. How are you seeing that show up? And how do you think it might show up, right? If you haven't seen it yet. It's such a good question Mm because I think it's like a question of access. I mean, I think we all know that Hollywood is notorious, notoriously difficult to find success in. And a lot of times for, for even the most, you know, prepared and, you know, most wealthy of people. Right. Although it's even harder for a lot of these groups who don't have, you know, parents who can support them while they're like struggling and trying to break in or, you know, don't go to film school or don't have the money to go to film school or come from communities where it's just not a path. So they like don't even know like how to start. Right. And in many ways may have and, better stories because of that. Right. Yes, you know, I would imagine, exactly, you know, exactly. Yeah. And like we're missing out on an entire swath of stories mm-hmm. because of how notoriously difficult it is right. and how a lot of people drop out, right? A lot of times it's a matter of just who can last the longest mm-hmm. and get to the place where they finally get their break. Mm-hmm. And um, that's why I think Web3 is so amazing. Like one of the projects that Jump Cut is working on is called Women of Mystery. And it's really an incubator for women's stories and underrepresented voices, right? Where anyone can access and we will help them figure out how to create a story, how to create a pitch, how to move that forward into creating IP that can then be exploited in TV and film, right? Because if the only way you can get something made or have a better chance to get something made is have a best-selling book or a hit podcast, like those industries are just as problematic as the, if not more problematic than the TV and film industry, right? And so can we create more access and more pathways for people who come from outside of the system? Because they have different stories. They have something different to say a lot of the time, right? Um, and I think a lot of people do end up breaking through, right? Like Stephen King used to work at a laundromat, right? Um, and, you know, I talked to somebody the other day who had a client who they're, they're now show running an animated show, but they worked at Target for like a really long time. And they just like took so long for them to break in and they were super talented. So they found success. But for every one of those people, there's probably 10,000 people who are just as talented, maybe who just don't have the access or don't know how to get in or don't know how to start. And I want to say that, like, not everyone who participates in these kind of community tor- storytelling things is necessarily going to become a famous writer, right? Of like, course not, right. That's not the point. I think the point is to, like, you know, to be able to have something, connect to something that you care about and do storytelling, which connects us all. Like, storytelling is something that existed um, for humanity before the wheel, you know what I mean? And so I think it's a really core part of human nature to connect over stories. But I think, you know, there are people who do have that talent who could probably have a career that might not otherwise find their way through. And so that's sort of one of the goals of Women of Mystery is to find those stories, uncover them, find people who have a harder time breaking in. And how do we support those people? Because um, their stories are important, too. And I think I could say you could say that a lot of the problems in the world come from like lack of empathy because of what's you know, put on screen is, is lacking sometimes, right? Not that there's amazing shows and all of that, but, and not that it's not slowly changing, but it's certainly not changing fast enough. Right. Um, and when, how and, can viewers or listeners of this stream find women of mystery? Did you call it? Where, where would someone find it? Yes. We're, we're going to have so, a whole panel about that tomorrow. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just to make sure people he's, aren't like, what did she say? Kind of what was it? Yeah. Go more in depth about yeah. it, but, um, Women of Mystery start started with the story of this. Um, we started writing these mysteries from the perspective of um, a woman of color who's a private detective who is solving mysteries on the blockchain. So the Twitter handle is at not Eva Morales. But the idea was in the first sort of iteration, we would open the writer's room and we would have something that we could start with that then we could flesh out with the community to teach them what makes a good story, what makes a good character, how do you create a pitch, all of those different kinds of things, where then moving forward, the community will be able to pitch their own ideas and select what they want to move forward into into writer's rooms that people can join to flesh out those stories that we will help figure out how to find the path forward with for them, you know? And so we're really lucky at Jumpco, we have like pretty deep connections on the film and TV side and, um, you know, we're, funded by WME and um, you know, we have shows with like Amblin and Disney and, um, and Viola Davis's company. And so for us, like, you know, we want to find those voices and that talent and have people co- collaborate to make them as strong as possible. Because I think those stories are going to be, we're going to find that they're different than what maybe is in the traditional system. Like I like it. I come from indie film. And the reason why I really wanted to, I love the indie film space is it's the people who can't get in who are like, I don't care. I love the story so much. I'm going to make it 
on my own with my own blood, sweat and tears and just convince whoever I can to come along on this ride with me. And that's really how um, things that would never get made in the system that are extraordinary get made and they would get crushed in the Hollywood, you know, gears. Right. And that singular vision and those kinds of stories, you know, are harder to make in the system. They're harder to get funded because it just, they're just more risky. And so um, sometimes you can find somebody who will be your champion and take the risk on it. But um, again, I feel like for every stranger things, right. We're like famously got passed on by 40 different companies and became like a mega juggernaut hit. That went against all of the conventional wisdom of Hollywood at the time. No adults are going to watch a show about kids and, oh, this is like a retread of like, just like Spielberg stuff, blah, blah, whatever it is. And, um, and for every one of those that makes it through, there are so many others that are just as good that just because it's risky, like nobody finds that champion, right? Mm -hmm. And so how can we um, find more paths and decentralize the creation process so that community is being able to decide and, um, and, and put out the things that they're excited about, right? Then you have that core audience who's already super pumped about it. Well, you said, you know, you said, um, you know, not everyone is necessarily going to become a famous writer. And I think that's a, that, you know, of course, you know, I think that is important to, to, uh, to say, but at the same time, you know, I find myself in my elevated age at this point to, you know, be very keenly aware that there's actually less time ahead than there is, you know, behind most likely, you know, uh, waiting for those breakthroughs. But, um, if that's the case, you know, I do find myself with kids and, you know, kind of having gone through a sort of certain amount of a career at this point going, you know, what are the things that really matter to me that I want to be able to say, did I actually really go for that thing that I wanted to do that I, you know, is, what are those things that I'm going to regret, you know, not just putting every bit of my blood, sweat, tears and effort, you know, into really trying to accomplish for myself. And I think there are a lot of people out there that for whatever reason, you know, they wanted to be a musician and they ended up going to law school or they, you know, there are just so many of those kinds of stories where you had an interest in something and doing something creative and doing something that was, you know, maybe not where you found yourself. And, you know, I think there are, many of those people out there that, you know, maybe they won't ever be a famous writer, but here's an opportunity to try that thing, to see, you know, is there a path here forward? And in a way that, you know, is, you know, actually considerably less daunting than trying to at, you know, uh, in a mature place in life, let's say, you know, go, oh, you know, I'm going to now quit being a doctor and go be a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and here's a way to, to kind of say like, oh, I can I can dabble in this thing that I love and see like, you know, is is this something that is worth, you know, continuing to pursue? Is this something I actually enjoy or is it just this kind of fantasy that I wanted to, you know, play with? So I think there are those kinds of opportunities, too, where, you know, this is a legitimate way to actually get in and try something and pursue that passion, even if it's not the the thing that you're like, oh, no, I'm dedicating my life to this. And if you are dedicating your life to that, well, then here, here's a great way in as well. <laughs> well I also think it's such an empowering space for creators because so much of Hollywood is spent waiting for other people yeah. to mm -hmm. say yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. So, you know, I, there's this amazing woman who's on, we have a council for women of mystery of people in web three and traditional media to sort of help, you know, shape, shape the course. And there's one woman of at Vargas who I love and she's so smart and she, she goes green light yourself, yeah. you know? And what I love about this is that, you know, for creators, instead of waiting for other people to say, yes, you can go build your own audience. You can go build your own story world. You can just go and do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, you know, again, the industry has a lot of barriers and there's like all these stories of people who, you know, that I've been collecting over time just because I was so fascinated by it. But a friend of mine is working on a TV show based on a Webtoons graphic novel. Mm -hmm. um, so she's writing the adaptation, but I started reading it. It's called Lord Olympus. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know it. Yep. But this, the woman who wrote Laura Olympus, she could not break into the industry in New Zealand at all. Like she just really struggled. And then she started drawing this in her bedroom on her own, started putting it up herself. It became huge because, you know, she had a direct access to the audience, right? Mm -hmm. And people were gravitating and selecting and loving what she was putting out. 
And then now she's making like $12 million a year. Oh, she's yeah. the best selling novelist. She's a show yeah. on HBO. Like, you know, just all of these things, right? Like where sometimes I think there's this idea that like somebody at high up, like knows what they're doing, you yeah. know, and they like have the pulse, finger on the pulse or whatever. And nobody knows. Yeah. That's, you know? that's so true. I, I, it reminds me, there was a, a book I read once called uh, the drunkards walk, which is, um, it has to do with randomness, you know, and how, how randomness rules our lives. And it's written by a statistician, actually. And he, he, but he writes, it's not like a dry, you know, academic sort of book. And he talks about um, movie executives and how there'd be movie executives in the past who, whoever they were, would have several hits that they green light. And then they'd green light a couple other projects, which would be a major flop, and then they get fired. But before they got fired, they green lighted a few more and they just take a while. Then after they're gone, a couple years out, those movies that they green green lighted or green lit or whatever, mm -hmm. again they come out and they're hits again, and it's like, oh, we fired them, you know? <laughs> well, that's because everything <laughs> regresses to the mean. There's not actually a rhyme or rhythm, so yeah. you know, all the Except things. Except that's the new you know. person gets credit for the thing. Well, exactly. Right. So well, they got killed because the new person doesn't want anyone else to get. <laughs> well, what's really crazy about what you say is I think that like that is the fear and somebody had put it to me this way at once which i've never forgotten was they called it like harvard westlake syndrome so like executives have children in private school and if they get fired then they have to pull them out and put them in a public school and so everything is driven by how do i not get fired <laughs> which means that you don't take the grades, you know yeah. and i i think that there are executives out there who do take big swings but they do them for the things that they're really passionate about, mm -hmm. right? So it's about finding that right executive who can help you with the big swing. But overall, it's like they'd rather bet on established creators mm -hmm. because it's like you don't get fired if you're like, oh, I greenlit this Tina Fey show. It didn't work. It's like, well, it's Tina Fey. Like yeah. everybody thinks it's going to work, right? Nobody like you can't fault yeah. <laughs> Or, you know, things that are based on a best-selling book or video game or whatever because, mm -hmm. you know, oh, this was a best-selling book. Video. Anybody would have greenlit that, And that's right? why you see so, so many graphic like, novels becoming series and movies and stuff yeah. today, yeah. Mm -hmm. and 100 million on a unknown creator who's never done anything before right. like i'm i'm and i'm like flabbergasted this article came out the other day about lord of the rings and how i didn't know this but the two showrunners of that have never had anything produced before yeah. this is their first yeah. Okay. anything yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they let these guys spend a billion dollars well we can we like, can geek out on this because I, I mean this this should be a whole panel in and of itself but i mean what's fascinating there is like they but to almost in the spirit of some of what we're talking about like they were the ones that had the pitch that the token estate responded to so it was yeah. like okay yeah. you got all these people who are established and they're pitching all these ideas and the people that get to say yes or no are saying no and so here are these guys who are new but who you know have a take. How Hollywood works is they would take those people and they put a show. They would right? normally, yes. Yeah. That's, you know that's I mean? the miracle they of that story. Them yes, to be yeah. the showrunner. Which, if you think about again, yeah. like going back to diversity and equity, inclusion, all these things, there are people within this industry who've been working for fifteen years yeah. who are women, people of color, who they will say, "Well, we won't even let you co-show." Yeah. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like for a, for not certainly not a billion dollar show, yeah. the biggest show in history, yeah. right? Yeah. In terms of the amount of money they spend. So anyway. That was just really interesting yeah, to me. No, you're right. It's fascinating. It's a, so, so, it's, so just thinking about these these tools that allow people to, you know, maybe find access in ways they couldn't have otherwise. There are things like webtoons, right, and Wattpad and, and stuff like that. And so, what do you think Web three adds to it that those types of tools or even YouTube or whatever don't provide? Oh boy. Hmm. Can I go? So I feel like yeah, I'm yeah. talking so no, much. No, no, no. It's, no, no, no. It's, <laughs> we wanted to talk to you, so here we here, here okay, we are. Okay. Um, <laughs> I what I'm really excited about with women of mystery, especially, is that the amount of your creative contributions earns you shares of the equity in the project and the IP. And um, you know, that's sort of what Jump Cut is built upon as a platform that is a centralized hub for being able to put out tasks to people like, oh, we need to pitch on this. But gamify it with a point system where it's like, okay, so 10 points if you do a pitch, 50 points if you land it. Right? right and yours is the one that's chosen by the community where then at the end of that we're calling them seasons but you know whatever at the end of that project where you're putting the pitch together or putting the ip together right we add up all the points that everybody did and then you divide it and the share of the ip is owned by that person so imagine like 
everybody, the golden goose is like, what if we could create Star Wars, right? But then it's community owned. Mm -hmm. What if you owned 0.25% of something that became Star Wars? And again, that's like a one in a million kind of thing. Not every project that's going to work is going to be Star Wars, right? But imagine that we could create a system where we're creating a lot of these things in a decentralized way where you could participate in a lot of different things. Um, and earn small pieces of, of different projects that you really believe in. Well, it's the, it's, and sorry, go ahead. I, I don't mean to interrupt. No, go, no, I'm done. I'm done. I, I was gonna say, I mean, okay. it, you know, we do all point to star Wars and, and I do that a lot too, cause I'm just a huge star Wars fan. But I mean, the, the fact is, what if you own 2% of, you know, the walking dead, what if you own 2% of, you know, even something that isn't kind of a, a massive worldwide franchise, but just has a really consistent wonderful fan base across you know different different media um so i think you know it's it is interesting to think about that you know the the there are things that get incubated you know right now whether it's you know easter ratio off of youtube or you know any any number of comics that have gone on to become you know tv shows that are not marvel and dc properties that you know come from independent creators and so I think, you know, there is the dream of like the huge franchise, but there also, you know, really is a reality to like being able to make a living as a creative person that isn't, you know, making you a billionaire, but is a sustainable, you know, ecosystem that you can kind of build out and build on top of. And so I think, you know, that spectrum of opportunity is what's, you know, to me so interesting and fascinating. And yet, to Bennett, to your point, the big difference, which is exactly what, you know, when he is saying, I think is that there's an opportunity to say, okay, yes, you could put stuff out on Webtoons or Wattpad and 1% of those creators are going to be massively successful. It's, it's still a YouTube type of model where, you know, the vast majority are going to make nothing. There's a middle class, which makes a little bit of money, but maybe probably still not even a living. And then there's like a, you know, an echelon above that, which is kind of making a living. And then there's the 1%, which is really doing very well on those platforms. And so it's still, you know, easy access, but, you know, still pretty challenging to monetize and to like really make that your full-time, you know, job or gig. Um, and so I think now, while this, a lot of those same complexities are still there with, you know, NFTs and Web3, I think it's the tools that allow for in success everyone that was involved, you know, gets to participate in that success and the potential for, you know, making a more significant return on that success, I think is, is much greater. Yeah. I also think if you have one writer on something, like you could tell your mom and all your friends to watch it. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> that's the community that's aspect that, right like, if everyone's yeah, talking about people it people who mm -hmm. participated at some point and said oh my god i can't believe this became a show that i pitched this character or yeah. this story idea is mine or whatever and they're telling all their people yeah mm -hmm. like in a lot of ways like it gives you a little bit of an advantage over the other things that don't have that because you're, everything is competing for your attention that same weekend if you imagine on netflix there's two movies and five shows dropping that weekend like, how do you get kicked up to the tier of the carousel that everybody goes through? Because people don't go in and search. Do you know what I mean? Right. They don't go and search for your show. They they look at what's available, mm -hmm. what the what the algorithm recommends. And I remember there was this um, show that um, was out of Norway or something. It was about Vikings. It was a comedy. I don't remember exactly what it was, what it was called, but. They said that they like just did some ads in the U.S., like Facebook ads for like Norwegian people in different cities <laughs> across <laughs> the U.S. And they spent very little money on it. But then those people watched it and it kicked them up into the tier where then people were able to find it. Mm. And they and then Netflix um, funded three more seasons. They didn't mm. make the first season. Right. And so, you know, if you have that sort of core community that's excited about it who's going to tune in that first weekend and you can coordinate that like that just gives you an advantage over other people mm -hmm. and i sort of like it a little bit to kickstarter where you're not just getting the money you know you're building your audience ahead of time yeah and you're building engagement but that's a, that's one way that's here's an update here's a trailer here's a poster right and they're about to they're able to get engagement and then when it comes out hopefully they watch yeah. it and they share it with their friends and whatever but this is two-way this is hey I'm, I'm casting right now. What do you think about these two auditions? Right. And you get to help me choose, you know, like people become so much more invested when they are part of the process versus, mm -hmm. you know, um, a, a kind of one way. Mm -hmm. happening. 
Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too. I think that, um, you know, the, 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 I think we're so early in this kind of web three concept of how some of these things work that what I keep coming back to also is that, you know, there are going to be the breakout stories, which we're just starting to maybe see the tiniest edge of, and I don't mean, you know, big projects, but I mean like people from within the community that do create meaningful kind of goes on to, you know, be, be meaningful is not really the right word, but I guess, you know, perceived as something that, you know, breaks out and, you know, has a, an impact in, in culture. And I think that, you know, as we talk about democratizing access and, you know, having more ways for people to get involved and to scratch that itch of, you know, wanting to be creative, we need those stories. I think those, those things will start to show and demonstrate like this new pathway for people. Um, and so I think as that happens, like we get to see this kind of influx of this new way of. I also think that the first wave of really successful Web3 projects yeah. um, are NFT and art based. And so now they're trying to reverse engineer story out of mm -hmm. it, right? Like mm -hmm. how many TV shows, films and whatever can you make out of like a whole bunch of monkeys? Like I'm sure something <laughs> will come out of it, but it's a challenge, right? Like I think it's more of a challenge. And yeah. so, you know, I think there are more projects now that are coming from a story universe mm -hmm. that are trying to, you know, with the web three ethos like combined it but story first right like it comes from story first mm -hmm. and like i think those are just starting to sort of you know trickle out and start to be built you know um mm -hmm. which i'm excited for yeah you well, know, I, I touched on takes longer to make that stuff so good i i think there's something else that's really interesting about the web three aspect of, of all of this too which is as you said in the beginning of our chat here winnie um i, I believe that most people have some creative spirit in them somewhere mm -hmm. but do we all have a novel in us or a movie you know or something um some would still say yes but i you know i think a lot of us just have like a cool character idea or something or like uh we would love to shout at the screen of our favorite show like what if they did this you know and so mm -hmm. so we while we may not be able to all like quit our jobs and run away with the circus i think a lot of us do want to chime in on something and and be able to say hey you see how they went over there that was my idea and none of the rest of this was, but that was, and isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to get that somewhere like Wattpad or, or whatever. You kind of have to either do yeah. everything or I'm sure there are people collaborating, you know, but in, in smaller groups and showing up with one character idea doesn't make you part of, you know, part of something in that way. But in, in this way, maybe you own the NFT of, you know, of that character or something. And um, you say, here's who I think they are. And everyone loves the, the idea. Boom. I don't know where else that my happens colleague, or if it can. My colleague David says something really smart. It's like there's waiters, there's swimmers, there's divers, mm -hmm. right? So some people might come in, they want to be a part of it, but they just want to like maybe vote, you know, or do polls. They don't necessarily want to write, but they want to help shape the thing. And this is good. And oh, no, I don't like that one. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to want to like come in and do a few pitches, you know, um, or, you know, oh, I like this particular task i'll go do that or whatever you know and then some people are going to be like i want to like learn i want to do this i maybe i don't know how to create a pitch but i'm going to do every single pitch and i'm going to show up for every single thing because i want to learn the craft right and so what's great about web3 it's open to all who want to dive into their you know interests and depending on how much time they have you know what they you know what they want to get out of it you know everyone is different different reasons why they want to be creative, right? Sometimes it's like a hobby and that's totally fine too. I think it's beautiful when people are just like writing because they have to write and then they stick it in a drawer, you know? Um, but again, like with writing, you don't get good until you start doing it, right? Like you have to just do it. And I think this gives people who maybe have that inkling or have always thought, well, maybe I want to try that, but never made the difference that to a community and a community of people and an outlet for trying it, right? Dipping their toe in it first. Mm -hmm. And I think the goal of Jump Cut in a lot of ways is to hook those people and then, oh my gosh, I, I can do this. Oh my gosh, I, I, I do really love doing this. And then they go deeper and deeper, right? Um, not everyone's going to, and that's fine too. We need those people too who are going to vote and yeah. who are going to watch it down the road. Mm -hmm. But it is about like your level of engagement, what you want to do. But 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 we were hoping that once people, 
you know, get a taste, then they're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. And then they yeah. want to dive really <laughs> fully into it. That's awesome. Well, I, I think we're we're starting to kind of run out of time, but I feel like we, we I want to talk to you for another several hours about this. I think yeah, that maybe maybe in just a couple of minutes, I'd love to hear. You know, we we heard a little bit about you know the edges of kind of how Women of Mystery is approaching this, and I know there are several other projects you know under the the Jump Cut umbrella as well. So I think part of the the you know concept for this conversation is like you know what are these kind of different ways of approaching this idea of community storytelling or you know the mm -hmm. the, the writer's room concept or you know maybe something completely different but just you know that's a big answer and now kind of a small amount of time but i'm curious like you know what are the different thought processes around you know kind of a, a, maybe some different concepts around how to approach that um, that's such a good question. And I, I think it's fascinating because I think every project is different, yeah. right? Even within Jump Cut. So um, we have Women of Mystery and that's more of like a storytelling collective, mm -hmm. right? And what's interesting about Women of Mystery is we're trying to bring in Web 2 writers um, into Web 3 and teach them. And so it's interesting because we have to do a lot of framing around like they don't know what an NFT is and they might have a negative reaction to what an NFT is. So how do we make it like, you know, it's Web 3 powered, right? But appealing to web two audiences yeah. who are writers and having quite a bit of success in terms of bringing in web two people um, who are interested in writing and just want to learn and want to be a part of something. There's nothing like this for them. Yeah. Right. And then um, uppercut, which is our other project is more of a martial arts action metaverse that's inclusive. And so that actually um, launched at the beginning of this month. And we started like the storytelling experience it was a little bit different, right? So the, the idea of women of mystery is that like we can start to create IP based around what the community wants to make or the stories that they want to tell versus uppercut is more like a deeper, bigger world and mythology that like we worked with um, Stephanie Smith, who's like a great friend of mine who is actually the writer um, on Laura Olympus that's adapting. And she also worked on the John Wick TV show and she worked on um, Carnival Row, which is like a huge world. She's like a world building genius. Yeah. And um, Kevin Tancheron, who is an amazing visualist and director who has directed for, you know, Marvel, Disney, done Star Wars. Like, he's just uh, amazing and just like a guy with a big heart. Um, and so work with them to sort of create this like bigger world in which when you minted a, a hero, um, which is basically like an NFT character, um, you join this like 10 week narrative experience. So we shot... Um, basically videos that delve into the mystery behind the martial arts that this uppercut training club is, 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 uh, is training their fighters in. Right. And every week there's like a puzzle or, you know, you, you read a little bit more of the mythology, you have missions that like you go on in real life and in the metaverse, right? Like, you know, check in at the gym and send us a picture and you get points, right? Do this meditation. It's about mental, spiritual, and physical wellness. All of those things combined, because that's sort of the spirit of martial arts. It's not just physical might, right? That makes a hero. And um, and then there's, it's sort of like, then also there's like story quests along the way where you start to build out your NFT character. So the question being, for someone who maybe is a, a, a person who's never really started writing before, but is interested in it, how do you break it down into discrete tasks over 10 weeks so that they can start to build out a really rich character yeah. that mm -hmm. exists within this world? And so this first week was last week and all these like lore submissions started going in. And so the Domos, like three different factions, like have a competition, right? And you get points for everything. And so it's like, it's really fun. It's been fun to sort of see it like come to life after having it be so theoretical for a long time. Yeah. Um, but uh, these lore submissions that are coming in are amazing. And what's really crazy is over half of them are over 500 words. People are spending a lot of time doing them. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff is really cool. Like, you know, we're going to do posts every week highlighting some of the great lore submissions. Um, but um, every week there's, you know, different ones like the core ones and then extra credit, right, if you really want to go deeper. Um, but by the end, every person who participates in the lore building will have their own really rich character that they created over the period of 10 weeks. And the idea is then to create story around those characters, you know, yeah. in future seasons, yeah. potentially. Um, and so that's a little bit more intense and involved and, and, and sort of like created a bigger framework, you know, that then it's a sandbox that everyone can play in and create their own stories, their own characters within it. 
Um, and then, you know, women mystery is very different, you know? So it's kind of cool that we have these very two different ways to collaborate on story um, and building worlds, but like, you know, with totally different yeah. approaches and paths, you know, I don't think that was, I, I guess it was purposeful, you know, to just, <laughs> but I don't know. No, I love that. I mean, I think this, this is why I find all this so fascinating is, you know, we're all, we're all figuring it out as we go along and then trying to apply what we think we learn <laughs> to the, the next day, the next project, the next, you know, person that we're working with and you know, so forth and so on. So super cool. Yeah. Super, super cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that women of mystery starts minting on Monday. Yes. So Ooh. we're One. super excited. And then the writer's room will start, you know, yes. end of the month probably. And, and um, we are, we are doing a whole deep dive into women of mystery yeah. and upper cut training yeah. club tomorrow. And we'll, Okay. That, we'll get that yeah. scheduled. Uh, that's uh, just a little tease. Uh, a little that's preview. just a little tease. But yes, minting on Monday, we'll make sure and uh, and make that a, a, a big point. Um, Winnie, where is the best place for people to connect with you directly or with you know Jump Cut? Yeah. Like how do how do people get in touch and and where should they follow? So I'm um, on Twitter, and it's at Winnie Y U A N K E M P Winnie Wan Kemp is my handle and you know i'm excited to connect with more people who are just excited about storytelling in this space because i really do believe a rising tide lifts all boats once one person figures it out and has a hit then it's much easier for other people to be like oh this works this works and you know we're doing this all together right even between projects and it's been awesome because you know, we're doing storytelling workshops for a whole bunch of different communities. You know, we're doing one for Boss Beauties on Monday. We did one for Women Rise. We're going to be doing one for World of Women, which is what our, you know, detective PFP is, yeah. is um, Eva's a wow. And, you know, I think for us, we just want to engage more people in storytelling and how, you know, fulfilling it can be and to build community around storytelling yeah. because, you know, I think there's like a profound disconnection right now within the world and, um, for me that the, the salve for that, like the cure for that is really about connecting with more people or the things that are, you know, that matter to you. And that, that's, that's, that's creating, that's writing, that's, that's, you know, making something together. And, and I think the more, the more of that, that happens, the, the better, I think we're all, we're all going to be, the better we'll all be in the world. There is absolutely nothing I could say that would be any better than that. So yep. <laughs> that's awesome. So Adam, I have to ask you, uh, what is a who give a flip? <laughs> Did I say it right? <laughs> yeah, we all, we tend to wrap these things up with a, a hoodma flip, which is simply Hujima a flip. very oh, I know what this is. <laughs> in terms of like, oh, whatever's top of mind. What are you watching? What do you recommend? What's your favorite podcast or game? What are you geeking out on right now? Yeah, yeah exactly. Where does this word come from? I have to know. <laughs> I it's I have no idea. It's an Just it's made a, it up. It's, very English. Did you make it up uh, or is it something that exists? It's a, it's a British. It's a British phrase. Yes. Yeah. We, I, I think of it as like the British whatchamacallit. <laughs> Wait, what, what, what are, is it again? I have to do uh, a flip. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> when you, when you, what are you geeking out on right now? What are you, what are you kind of, as, as someone just enjoying some kind of uh, media experience, what's, what's your thing right now? Hmm. That's a good, really good question. What have, I loved? what have I loved lately? Well, I could say what I'm like really excited about. I, I really love um, this show on Hulu called The Great. Mm. And oh, yeah. I don't know that a lot of people watch it. Um, so please watch it because it's really good. They're coming on the new season, I believe, but it's um, Nick Holtz and Elle Fanning. And it's basically the story of Catherine the Great, but like not not tied to history like it sort of uses her as this vehicle yeah. for um both you know really profound things and very hilarious things right. it's it's a hysterical show and it's it's i just love the tone of it because i'm i'm a big fan of like mixed tones mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. you know are funny but also scary but also emotional and just like those are the hardest things to execute i think and so when somebody does it so perfectly i'm just like in awe of it you know um, so I, I just love that show. It's awesome. Nice. Bennett, what about you? What are you geeking out on these days? I was just trying to think. Um, God, uh, 
I've, I've just recently started watching um, The Witcher uh, on Netflix, mm. which, mm. which is totally up my alley, but it, it, and it's been, up, been out for a while, and I've never played the video game, but yeah. I have liked it. Um, it didn't blow me away, I'll say that, but, but I do mm-hmm. like it. But I think the thing I've really been... I just was reading through over the last couple of days, again, it's not a long read, is um, there's a graphic novel called Day Tripper. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. know this, uh, this, this book or not, but it was... Um, Written by Fabio Moon and Gabriel Ba. Um, yeah, creators of the Umbrella Academy. Yep. Yeah, the guys who created the Umbrella Academy. They're, I, I guess, they're brothers, even though yeah. they have different last names. But um, that's a story. If you ever want to pause and just think about life for a minute, read that book. <laughs> because uh, every chapter he dies again at different ages throughout his life. So it's like, what would my end look like if I died when I was eight? when I'm 50, when I was 27, when I'm, you know, 80, and how did that impact the relationships with romantic relationships and his best friend and all these different things. And uh, just an incredible read. So that's awesome. To get right. yeah, I'm rereading it, <laughs> but uh, I've read it a few times already. That's awesome. Well, Winnie, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time today to have this conversation with us. I, I expect it will not be the last time that we uh, yeah. dive into some of these topics. <laughs> and um, I love yeah. it. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I love getting to talk with you guys about all of this like super exciting stuff because it just again, like, I think we're all sort of looking for, you know, new ideas and always want to be able to shift and adapt and change. And we're all kind of in the thick of it. So it's great to be able to just connect and, yeah. and, and, and get excited, you know? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and we are absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Well, um, yes, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And we will be doing more. Uh, actually, we've got a bunch of, of colleagues of yours over the weekend. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, platforms for storytelling and how we think about building tools for some of this stuff with uh, Dillip later today and then uh, Uppercut um, and Women in Mystery tomorrow. So yes. lots more lots more from the, uh, the Jump Cut uh, Collective, uh, which would be great. And then uh, coming up next in just a few minutes, we'll be talking to uh, the creator and kind of mastermind behind the Huxley universe which is going to be a fun conversation as well so uh tune in for that coming up in just a few minutes um bennett thank you so much yes, for hosting thank this you. conversation i always thank you, love always great story. talking to you guys and uh and i will just make the request of anyone watching or who finds this later to like follow and subscribe because we're gonna have a bunch more cool content so, <laughs> awesome stuff thank you guys so much we'll thank, you. thank you thank you